Yeah. All right, and welcome everybody to Senate Education. Education. We are live uh, Wednesday, February 28th, 239. Let's get back from the floor. Couple of just updates for those that are watching our work. S120, that relating to post-secondary schools and sexual misconduct. I know that University of Vermont and the network have had some conversations. They're meeting again tomorrow. I would anticipate a new draft of that bill upon our arrival back, if not before, in your boxes. And if so, I will give everybody a heads up so they can review it. Um, CTEs, we're going to take some testimony, a little more testimony today, but I have asked the Secretary of Education to convene a bit of a working group between now and when we get back, just to get everybody on the same page so we can move that. End of the week stuff, I feel like literacy, library, new Americans, technology, that'll all move. And then upon our return, miscellaneous ed, which I know there are a number of things already in it, and I believe there are at least possibly two proposals to put additional things in it. So um, with that, as a quick update and overview, uh, William Smith, uh, Vermont uh, Retail Lumber Dealers Association, who's sitting behind me, is uh, has asked a couple of folks to come in to talk a little bit about uh, S304 uh, CTEs. And so with that, Bill, are your folks you want to say anything before we get going, or if, you... if, if uh, staff has them in the in the queue, I think we can just go straight to Tim and Ed. True. In this here, in this here, Combs. Combs. Yes. Hey, Mr. Combs. There he is. Hey, Mr. Holmes. Good to see you. Thank yeah, you. Good so, to see you. Thanks so much for your patience. It's that time of year when the you know we're wrapping things up before crossover and we're on the floor. And so uh thank you for being with us. We uh as Mr. Smith has already indicated, you have some testimony regarding S304 and CTEs. And so we uh I know you have no written testimony, but you'd like to share a few words. And so I, the floor is yours. Okay, so yeah, I um, I'm a product of the Career Center myself, so I know how uh, how important it is uh, for students not wanting to further their education, uh, such as myself back in in uh, mid '80s. So um, I think it's real important, and and that it's a top priority, number one with um, making it so that we're not the the money's not being tracked from the high school to the to the career centers. And I say that because I think that um, the high schools get hung up with losing students to career centers and they tend not to um, send kids to the career centers where they can learn better. And we need to do a better job with making sure our students get what they need versus what the schools need. So First and foremost, the the funding will be a, a huge priority in my opinion. Um, credits also the the credits um, need to also be available for um, students to be able to graduate, um, just like the rest of their fellow classmates. By maybe having, I understand that maybe there's math and science currently in like a construction tech class but we need to add the the english credit to that so that kids can maybe spend more time down at these career center classes uh, versus the high school classes because uh, that's where they're going to learn the best um, with the hands-on and and i'm uh on the board of directors with hannaford career center here in in middlebury so i work pretty closely with the instructor here nick nick cantrick and uh, he's telling me that it would be nice to have the students for a little bit longer periods than just maybe a two-hour classroom due to the fact that they just start getting working on, like they work on tiny homes in their shop and uh, they just get started working and they have to, you know, clean up for the day. So 
the longer that they have down there and have more access to hands-on and working on these projects, um, but still being able to get their credit so they can graduate with the rest of their classmates, that would be very helpful. Um, I'd also um, think that somewhere in the language that we could write that that maybe counselors and teachers alike from the high school would go and visit these career centers at least once um, during the year early on so that they have a good feel for when they have students in their classrooms uh, and talking with them and as they're teaching these kids that they can point these kids in the right direction and get them in these right classes for the each student. So I think that it's important for the teachers as well as counselors to visually go down and look at all of what's available in these career centers. And, um, and that way they can put these kids in the right direction for the best learning. Um, and, and the other thing that, that I feel is the earlier we can get these kids involved and, um, and at least seeing the, the programs that are available and the careers that are available um, for them to be able to stay in Vermont, be productive community members in Vermont, and make a good living, because you can make a good living in many of the industries that, that are out there to offer, whether it's working for a good roll lumber or a WW building supply, or if it's a contractor, electrician, plumber, you name it. Uh, and we all we all have a stake in this to keep our kids here. We really, we're really aging out. Um, a lot of our contractors that I see are in their 60s and 70s, uh, still going strong. However, that, you know, we're going to need some younger generation moving in here. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble uh, later on down the road. Um, and I guess lastly, the thing that I'd uh, like to say and, and invite everybody is we have a building Bright Futures event, um, March 26. It's Tuesday at the Vermont State College in Randolph. And this is a, we've got 140 kids so far signed up uh, to come with their instructors. And we put on a, a, a half a day show for these kids that we show them around the campus. We also uh, have different uh, programs set up and, and we have people in, in a speaking classroom where they can give testimonials. Uh, we're going to have a lumber person. We're going to have a road salesman. We're going to have a contractor so that these kids can come in and talk uh, to these people and um, and listen to the mentors as to the careers that people have put together here in Vermont and um, and and done very well for themselves. So I'd, I'd put the, uh, the invite out to all of you folks as well as your colleagues up there that uh, this is our third year running with this um, and and you'll see a lot of a lot of kids come through and uh, it's exci it's exciting for us to put this on for these kids and uh, this year we actually have a little something special that that uh, we've taken on and we're going to have a shining star from every center uh, the instructor has picked an individual that really shines above the others and we've gotten some donations from a lot of our our suppliers and the, these kids are going to end up with a really nice Milwaukee tool belt with all of the proper hand tools in it to get them started in a career um, and that's going to be handed out um, by the instructor of that class and they're going to be recognized that day at the end of the day um, so again the invite is is open to you folks. Thanks, appreciate that. And your testimony is is uh, also appreciated and very consistent with what we've heard from getting kids involved at a, a young age, getting them engaged. Uh, one of the things I'm wondering is how many, you have a sense of the number of kids that you need to turn away every year and say, hey, we, we just don't have the, the room or are you able to accommodate everybody? The With the career center, or are you talking Careers, about? With the career center. Yeah, um, you know, we need, um, we need to work on that obviously as well. I think some of the, the pre, 
requisite to being in this construction tech is you need to take maybe um, a mechanical science class for like the ninth and 10th graders. They take that first and then they kind of jump into this, this other class. So there's several steps and several different teachers that can, can work through it. Obviously we have to have the staffing just like we do in high schools, but um, I think that that would be a key component as well. Any questions, uh, committee, at this point before we shift? Uh, no, I just wanted to comment on the on the um, recommendation to have counselors visit CTKs as a backup in case the students, as a group, can't. Uh, if the logistics get too difficult for the students to get to the center, at least the counselors. That's like I'd say that's like bare minimum. That's a great recommendation. Please interview. Uh, yeah, I would second what you just said, and I would um, I would increase it to or expand it to teachers visiting the tech centers because really teachers are connecting with students all the time, and they could make a suggestion or yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so, I, I also think that that's key is that not <laughs> just the counselors but the high school teachers. So. Um, they're seeing these kids day in and day out in their classrooms, and we really need to get these kids where they're going to learn the best. And and a lot of times it is with hands-on versus books. And I, I totally think that the teachers can benefit by just going down and visiting all these uh, opportunities for these kids. Yep. Great. Senator please. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I think one thing, it's more of a general comment, one thing I'd like to explore, I don't know, I don't think that we'll have time to do it within the next week, but is really looking at uh, apprenticeships as well. And, you know, the reason I say that is, you know, with, with these businesses, there's definitely a lot of professional and community uh, relationships between the businesses and contractors. And, you know, when I'm thinking about some of these centers that have to turn away students, you know, can we create a sort of revolving program or not a revolving program but this a schedule where you know a, a student can job shadow uh, a carpenter for example and you know we create a certain set of guidelines to make sure that the carpenter is an experienced qualified carpenter not just a random person who knows how to use a table saw but uh, you know have, have a list of contractors who are well qualified and experienced have that student you know job shadowing that carpenter yeah. and then another day during the week going to the classroom and then switching the students who are in the classroom going out and doing actual job shadowing in the field or construction sites right? i love that idea uh, yeah and i wonder if some of it can be done under uh flexible pathways i'm not sure but I, yeah it gets them right out i, I think it's terrific were you going to comment on that yeah so to answer that uh we have we have been doing that um, I last year took three students, um, they would come here for a week after school for two or three hours, they would come and, and actually work in the yard, or I would sit with them and go over what I do uh, during the day, as far as placing orders and how I manage inventory and things like that. So we are doing that currently. We've, um, I, I've got a really good working relationship with the instructor here, so I see him on a daily basis almost when he comes in for supplies or or he calls me or emails me. Um, but we did have three students that, that came with us for one week and they would switch off. The next week it would be a different student and they would learn different uh, parts of our business. And um, that was really successful. And there also is... Um, I know that uh, Dennis Newton Electric does the same thing. Salamander Construction is a construction company. They are currently doing it as well. So it is being done and that's a great way to get these kids out in the field because um, I, I just can't stress enough that a lot of these kids just need to learn with their hands and hands-on is how they learn. That's great to hear. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. I mean, whatever we can do to support that moving forward, uh, yeah, please let us know. Yeah, and I would say one of the things that we should remind the agency of education about is this idea. Particularly, we're giving uh, the agency or suggesting the agency have a new full-time position for CTEs, and it's the governor's recommend. This would be a 
great thing for that person to sort of sink their teeth into and make sure that what Senator Hashim is describing is happening around the state, which I don't think it is, but how can we, how can we get it more and more around the state? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, as a group, our VRLDA board is, um, is really working very closely. And I know Ed works with, with a couple of his, uh, uh, career centers down down south and uh, just all over our state. We've our board really takes pride in in uh, getting these kids educated and in our fields and keeping them here in Vermont. So we are working um, quite hard on this as a as a board, Vermont Retail Lumber Dealers. Great, thank you. Uh, if you don't mind sticking around, Mr. Combs, we're going to uh, shift to Mr. Druk and. Um... Ed, thanks a million for being with us. Uh, and wondering if you'd like to share your ideas and thoughts with the committee. Yeah. Um, so again, I own two lumber yards here in southern Vermont, Wyndham County, New Fane, and Wilmington. Um, again, we like Tim says, we're tied to these. We're two career centers, Brattleboro and then Springfield, is the two that we're connected to the most. Um, and then hearing some of his testimony, a lot of it's the same. We go up there, we send a lot of our suppliers to to Springfield, especially to do seminars on women windows, window installations. Um, we do uh, roofing uh, things with them, uh, so they get. We're involved in doing a lot of that ourselves, and more than willing to do it for it. One thing that you mentioned about kids being turned away, um, being on the Springfield uh, yeah. board of that one, they had trouble getting enough kids there here a few years ago. Yeah. It is now turning around, I think, because it is being to the forefront. Uh, you know, more kids are being exposed to it than they have been. Again, they need to be exposed earlier. Um, they need to be exposed to things that they need to learn just to get out into the field every day. I, even if they don't get into necessarily a career in this, it's a lifelong thing that is so important um, to every student, I think. Just learning how to read a ruler is, you know, just something they can take along with them uh, that we don't see happening. Uh, I think that the funding really needs to turn to these career centers. Um, I, I think that's a major part of what's been lacking for our high schools to make sure that our students are exposed to that. But again, uh, I think this is a step in the right direction seeing this, this bill. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, are you both in Wyndham County? No. No, okay, very no, I'm in Addison County. Uh, and I agree, you know, it'd be great to have all kids exposed and at least have that opportunity to experience it. It's such a, uh, so much of Vermont, I feel our educational philosophy is rooted in John Dewey, this learning by doing, and the more kids, again, uh, any skill level, any academic level, go and, and and learn the things that you're all teaching. It's going to feed them with their what's happened. It's going to feed the classroom, and then to certainly feed their lives afterwards. So, so it's I really appreciate what your your support on this, and I agree. It's great. It's front and center. This is one of the first times I think in my 14 years in the building that CTEs are really front and center in the legislature. So uh, looking forward to seeing what the next few months bring and what our final product look, look, looks like. Anything yeah. else, committee? Mr. Smith, anything else? Oh, thank you, Mr. Sharp. Yeah, it's been terrific. Thank you both very much. And please, uh, we'd encourage you to continue to follow your, our work as much as you can. Uh, and if, as we're, Making our way uh, toward a final product, we may uh, reach back out to you for additional testimony. But in the meantime, just please accept our, our gratitude. Well, thanks we appreciate for your guys. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your time. Bye now. Thank you. Is anyone going to join us?
don't know if we ever do. We don't get you in the chair much, do we? No, yeah. I'm usually just watching. So it's my pleasure to be here today. So well, in it's this chair. We're thrilled that you're here and you're coming in on electronic devices. You and I had a conversation a little bit this morning. And to remind everybody, we'll have a walkthrough of what the bill looks like later. And I do for schedules and really going to try to move things along as quickly as possible so that we can pull out of here in the next hour and change. Um, your thoughts on 284. Okay. And then I think you also have, correct me if I'm wrong, some thoughts on 204 that you want to. I do. And Senator Kulik and I touched base on that too. If you so, touch base on it, that might yeah, be enough for right I'm, I'm fine to move this along. I'll, I'll say for the record, I'm Karen Timmerman, Director of Policy Services and Legislative Affairs at the so. Vermont School Boards Association. Um, you're all looking at my testimony. I'm just going to give a kind of a little background. We, um, we by we, I mean, um, I worked with Chelsea Myers with Vermont Superintendents Association just to draft some suggested language, just to give everybody kind of a sense of what, what we were thinking. Um, I just want to reiterate that we're not here to su support or oppose the draft. We just um, wanted to share our concern for your consideration. Sure. <laughs> so as you know, the draft re um, tasks the AOE with drafting a model policy regarding cell phone use in schools. Um, draft 1.1 1, 1. 1 says that, you know, the minimum requirements for the policy are all articulated in the bill. Things like, you know, storage, location, consequences for violation, family communication channels, et cetera. Those are pretty specific. And we believe that those details are better addressed through guidance from the Agency of Education. So school district policy provides overall direction to school administrators. Um, example, like an example of a policy in this area would be, you know, no cell phones during class time or no cell phones during the school day. And the responsibility of the how to carry out the policy rests uh, in the, with the superintendent. So really the way we think about it is policy is meant to endure for a period of time and then the procedures can be more flexible. So as an example, if the policy that came out of AOE were to say, you know, no cell phones during the day and all students must put the, their phones in a yonder bag. Well, what happens next year when yonder bags are no longer what students, you know, like the preferred method of, you know, preventing student, uh, students from using their phones. So a policy, and when you're having these conversations at the community level, it would look like, where does our community like sit with this, right? What do we feel like, it, it, you know, is an acceptable amount of use, no use, some use, you know, and those would get ironed out in the policy, but then the, how are we gonna implement this in the schools? would be up for the up to the superintendents. And if the agency of education wants to provide guidance, mm -hmm. that's fine. But that's why we um, set out the law so that it's clear what should go in the policy and then what would be left for guidance. And we used guidance as opposed to procedures because it's our understanding that some schools are dealing with this not through procedures, but through um, student code of conduct. Mm -hmm. So guidance just gives schools flexibility. Yeah, and just to remind, and I know you know this from our conversation, having followed it, but others watching, this guidance that we're coming up with is just to, again, help districts that are struggling, that would be the fault, frankly, don't have the time, but given every other constraint on their, their schedules. Um, and you are looking, in terms of, this is an actual language that you're suggesting. The following language could be inserted. Yeah. Yeah. We just wanted to make it easy because we know you're trying Beautiful. to get this bill out. So easy is great. Yeah. Yeah. Hard is bad. Okay. Great. Any and questions for Ms. Zimmerman or any concerns? Please. Um, were you look? I'm looking. I see that we have draft 2.1 and your uh, testimony reference is 1.1. I just want to make sure nothing's getting lost in what you wanted to share with us versus what we have in front of us. I don't think so. I can't remember what was changed on the slate from draft to draft, and that may have been a typo on my part too. I don't think so, unless... No, I don't think so. Because we just got to... Oh, you did. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so I have not had a chance to look at it yet. Unless you changed what should go in policy and what should go in guidance, I would say this would probably still work. Oh. 
because it's really not, we're not making changes to the bill. We're just kind of offering some suggestions for how it's organized. Oh, good. Okay, good. Welcome. All right. That's you walk us through this this afternoon. Thank you. you. Have this unless there's major objections. Yeah. Great. It's amazing. Okay. The St. James. I think she. I know we're a little bit off here, Morgan. Is she ready to take us through New American Advancement? She says she can hear the team can hear. Okay. So if she would, we'll wait for that. In the meantime, S two o four. Reading, assessment, and intervention. Josh Soulier. How are you? Hi, how's it going? Um, for the record, Great. Andrew. Andrew Proughton, Assistant Director of oh, uh, Education Quality. Yeah, Josh actually got called in to to um, House Ed today, so we we kind of split um, split it up. So okay, just give me one second, Josh. I just want to get to our most recent draft. Um, there's a chance that, um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think Beth has, um, drafted it because, I'll tell you why, because I emailed, hold on, let me just get an email that I have, sorry about this, no Whilst in our village, just looking, I'm just one of this Nancy here. Yeah, and Arika Radke. Okay. S284 2.1 that. That just got put in our folder, right? So I haven't seen it yet. That is correct. And what's going to happen, Senator, is uh, between 3 15, probably 3 30, Beth will come down. Just walk us through, through the whole thing and see where everybody's at. I Please told her. her. I told her I was going to do a close read on the new draft and then get back to her, but then the floor went on pretty long and then I get that chance to. So I'm sorry. I no, can't no. even. Um, I have a copy of it here, so I can send it to Morgan. And maybe no, um, what I'm wondering is, and maybe we'll just hold on for one second. Andrew, tell us a little bit first about what you would like to say and your questions or concerns. And I'm wondering if Senator Buick, do you want to tee him up? Is there something in particular that you were uh -huh. interested in? Well, it was really on the advice of um, Kara Zimmerman, the board language. Did, did you want to, who wants to speak to that? That was the new language oh. that I asked them to put in there. Oh, you mean for S204? Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I can have the in front of me. Uh, Morgan, give us the most recent. Is that going to be too confusing, do you think, for people? Or do you, is it easier for you just to sort of tell everybody a little bit of the background? Uh, there's, there's, sure. We can do that. Yeah. I can give you the back. Okay, why don't you go ahead, Senator Hewitt. Um, so it was just about um, the board, the school board, and who drafts policies. And is it at a district level or a board level? This is similar to the conversation that we just had. When you're on a school board, you often say, you often put your make sure that you stay in your lane and that you don't get operational. And so that's what we wanted to try to avoid is, is having school boards acting as school districts and um, not making sure just they, they're not getting operational. So that's what this is, this new language is about. So, and do we have a copy of just that new language? Would you want to just read it to us? It's, um, sure. It's in, uh, let's see, page, if you're, if you're looking at the bill, it's page four of the bill and it's line three no, wait, that's for that further. 16. Okay. Each local school district and approved independent school shall engage local state. Hold on, that's not it. Sorry. That's okay. Oh, oh, she just, all she did was remove the word board, sorry, from page five, line eight of draft 4.1. 
So that was one that was the change. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, and wait, which bill are we? We're looking at 204, yeah, draft 4.1. Is it the most recent you have one? Uh, the most recent I have is three one. Yeah, let me send this to Morgan's guy. So Morgan has uh, Senator Dulick has four point one. We'll print that up and then we can all take a look at it. Senate Education three nineteen. We're looking at draft four point one of S two oh four uh part of our literacy bill and Senator Hewlett, um, if you would just lead us through the sections that you want us to take a look at, that would be great. So there are some small changes in yellow that you can see. Um, but, well, yeah, let's just go through. All right, so page one is the same. Yeah. Page two is the same. Page three is the same. Four. Four. Um, and this goes back just to uh, refocus us to the part that you were talking about before we went off around. Well, no, this part here on page four is, I mean, I've, I've been trying to really balance um, this bill between, you know, my constituents, reading experts, and then the AOE and the folks on the ground doing the work. So it's Great. a balancing act. And um, it's hard to get it right. Um, and so we're doing our best, but we did, uh, a lot of folks were very, very passionate about calling out um, a particular way of teaching, reading, which is harmful to kids. Um, and, and would you just say what that is? Because I think we've all got emails about that. Right, the three queuing system. Three yes. So thank you. I tried to find some language that would be, um, would would mention it as something to to not use and avoid without you know trying to be too prohibitive. So the language that you see now, and maybe, maybe Beth was going to get to this, but public and approved independent schools shall not use instructional strategies that do not have an evidence base, such as three queuing systems. So it's just there as an example of a strategy that is not founded or based in evidence. So that was one change that. Uh, was worked on, and I'll let Beth go through the smaller changes there, and then down further, uh, each local school district and group independent school shall engage local stakeholders to discuss the importance of reading and solicit suggestions for improving literacy and plans to increase reading proficiency. This takes out really specific language that was in the draft before around the local literacy plan. Um, and again, that was this was a hard decision to make, but this just um, allows for more inclusivity between local school districts and approved independent schools. So we thought, I thought that was a good. So why was it hard? What's the challenge with it? Tell me. Well, my sense is, and I could be wrong, and the experts can weigh in, but my sense was that if you if you point specifically to the local reading plan, and I'm not sure if I'm getting the language exactly right, but the independent schools wouldn't have been included in that language because it's it's something that is necessary or required for public schools, but not independent schools. So by making them, this language a little bit less prescriptive means that everyone can be included. Ms. St. James, would you add to that since you were the drafter? Tell us the before and after. That's St. James, the Office of Legislative Council. So the language that you see in on page five, subsection F. Actually, it's page four. Subsection F. Yeah, we're off by, for some reason, we're off by the page. What draft are you working 4. on? 4.1. Okay, so am I. Hmm. Um, do you have it posted on your website? Uh, I believe it is. Do you don't? Do you want me to hand you my copy? Well, I'm sorry. I, I think I'm looking at what's posted is the same as what I have. So, um, uh, subsection F, let's just go with subsections. I'm going to make you all work. Um, subsection F, 
Each local school district and approved independent school shall engage local stakeholders to discuss the importance of reading and solicit suggestions for improving literacy and plans to increase reading proficiency. That's language that's actually taken directly from the bill as introduced. The prior language read, Each local school district and approved independent school shall engage local stakeholders through the needs assessment and asset mapping processes right. when developing a local literacy plan to improve reading proficiency. So the needs assessment, asset mapping process, and local literacy plan are concepts that are specific to the public right. school system. Mm -hmm. So the theory behind this language change is public schools could still do that yeah. to fulfill subsection F. Approved independent schools are still required to engage stakeholders, but there's no specificity on how they do that. Right. I think for me, there's still the big question, and maybe this Senator Fuel can help from stakeholders. Like, what what does Section F on the ground really look like? That's the part that's a little confusing to me. Because in, when I look at it, I think, oh, it means engaging businesses, the community, everybody in literacy. I mean, I think the stakeholders are pretty prescribed through the needs assessment and asset mapping process. But this, because we take that, we take that, that out of that. Yeah. I think it gives people leeway. It looks like this arm only wants to say something. Yeah, I just want to say, did you want to first? No, okay. Uh, Glenn Carmoli, I'm the um, advisory, the, the chair for the advisory council on literacy and a curriculum director. And we do uh, needs assessment and mapping. Uh, Stakeholders uh, is a uh, is part of a requirement that we have when we have federal dollars. We have to do stakeholder engagement for various pieces. So as we develop plans, we have to do outreach, sometimes to specific uh, subgroups or specific. Uh, Please tell us who they are. Like so, who uh, are the people that are? We would um, reach out to um, homeless organizations, uh, organizations that support poverty, organizations that support equity, um, uh, business, it could be businesses. So you're trying to, to uh, invite uh, comment on as we develop plans, in this case, in the area of literacy, in order to develop and finalize our plans. We're trying to meet the needs of community Got and it. representatives, uh, our students, uh, various needs. So uh, this is just in terms of these folks will be engaged during the the stakeholder process where if you're gathering information. Correct. That kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Pre-planning Pre and, yep. and planning up until right. you final. Right. Right. But to Senator Campion's question, is this do you foresee that this could cause confusion in districts? No, I actually I, it's good. I love when you said less prescriptive. I think okay. that is yeah. extremely helpful. Okay, great. Beautiful. Anything else well, on not... 204 right now? Yes. Okay. There was the next page on page five at the top. Kara, did you want to speak for that one? I'm, I'm happy to speak to it if it's helpful for. Uh, well, it was your six to Yeah, so it's so. so uh, I it's agree not out. highlighted. Is it new? Yeah, I, okay. I highlighted it. Right, you highlighted yours, which is great, but the rest of us. <laughs> you took out a word. You took out a word. Right, seriously. You took out a word. I'm not ready to give that to her yet. <laughs> yeah, of all the changes, this is probably yeah. one of the smaller ones, but I just flagged it for consideration. Please. Um, now it reads each local school district and approved independent school shall engage local stakeholders. Uh, oh my gosh. So I have each. That's not what it where uh, uh, it begins each supervisory. Sorry. Uh, okay. yeah, I, I was reading that in language. Uh, each supervisory union and approved independent school shall annually report in writing to the agency the following information in prior year performance by school. The earlier version said each supervisory union board and approved independent school. And what I had flagged was just that school boards aren't in possession of, of the but data. Yeah. That's a responsibility of the, of union. the superintendent. Yeah. yeah. So the word was removed and we are happy with the new version. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Terrific. Ms. Kermoli, come on up. Are we good with all this? And then we'll move to you. We're going to have. One sit there. Andrew, are you ready to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. 
And Andrew, have you seen 4.1? We just emailed it to you. Yeah, I'm going through that right now. Okay. So, thanks, Mike. I think it's in our folders already. Okay. I appreciate bringing extra copies. Um, not going yet. Okay. We're going to go to Andrew first, and we're going to uh, go right over to you. Andrew, thoughts on 4.1? Yes. So um, the prompt kind of given to me it was, um, or actually I should reintroduce myself, right? Since you went on break. So uh, Andrew Proughton, I'm the uh, assistant director of the education quality division at the agency of education. Um, so for when I, I was scheduled, it was to um, speak about how um, our data collection around teaching licenses in, in relation to this this bill. Um, yeah. So I actually wasn't sure if there were specific questions. I have a couple different, you know, thoughts depending on on what would be most helpful for you on on sort of um, the conversations we're having around um, around this and, and the guidance that my office would be giving. Um, yeah. So I think the question came up last week, and maybe it's been a little bit in the air in the state house. Is is there a connection to teacher licensure and this bill. Are we making that connection at all? And I'm looking at Senator, I'm looking at Senator St. James in the back. Uh Ms. St. James, are we making that connection at all? Is there any connection to teacher licensure in this? Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um I S303 is a very large connection yeah, to yeah. teacher licensing. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is the connection to teacher licensing is in that you are requiring them to do something yeah. in the use of their license. Yeah. <clears throat> but I am not seeing anything in S204 that I would say is a licensing requirement. And I think that's... Oh, please go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. The, subsection G... On page, well, page five on what is posted on your website, the subsection G does say, the agency shall provide professional learning opportunities for educators with evidence-based reading instructional practices that address the areas yeah. of phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Yeah. So. That is essentially what S303 is doing. Right, right, right. Um, I'm just scrolling here. Um... I don't see anything in here that's tied directly to licensing other than subsection G. Yeah, no, it's, it, and I think that was the, one of the questions, and that's why uh, we had you come in, Andrew, unless you have other big concerns about this bill at this point, I don't know we need you. I mean, that, that's where we are at this point. We are looking for big major concerns, things that are going to uh, come up on the floor, et cetera. Anything from your end? Not from a licensing perspective. Um, I know that an earlier draft, it, it looks like it's not in there anymore, was was a recommendation around reading specialists, but um, I don't think that's a concern. I'll um, I'll send this version to to the Emily's and, and folks within Student Pathways to make cool. sure they have have eyes on it and um, can relay any any concerns from from that team. Great, because I think we're we're getting close. We're gonna hear from Ms. Carmoli, who's gonna probably, again, just, there's a few suggestions. Independent school folks are coming in tomorrow and then I'm hoping we are done. Please, Ms. Carmoli. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. See Thank you, Andrew. Bye. Thank you. I only have a few comments and really I'm here for any questions as you're in the final phases of uh, moving this, you have Great. a few different literacy bills that yeah. I know that you're working through. Uh, my first comment is, Thank you so much. This is huge work that you're doing. Uh, and you've created a lot of energy and resource uh, in literacy across the state by the uh, use of the Act 28, the funds at the Agency of Education to create resources to have uh, the professional learning modules created to create the Advisory Council on Literacy. And um, it, it's a collective, um, and I would say pretty unifying uh, energy around improving things. That's really exciting, so thank you so much for that. Um, last time I was here, you gave me an A. I'm gonna give myself a C plus starting, but I'm gonna okay, well, out see how I, let's and see what's C good. plus is because I was in a really big hurry. It wasn't sure I was gonna make it today, so I threw together a testimony and I'm noticing typos. 
Oh, uh, and that's going to drive you crazy. So I promise I'm actually going to clean up coffee. Yeah, we won't. Um, Morgan did, though. Just uh, this areas to consider. Um, one new address, which was about that data collection from school board striking the word right. board. Um, right. Thank you. Um, another one I think you've addressed, and, and uh, Senator Bullock, I think you were really describing this, as you've been doing that balancing act. You've been taking... Um, hope and and a lot of input and then requirement and trying to work that together and i think you've done a really nice job Amazing. So the, it's a really great job uh, you, is awesome. yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when um that point about what we're trying to do in this bill is do a universal literacy screening that includes the screening for dyslexia characteristics yeah it is not necessarily a single dyslexia screener, nor is it the identification. And you've done a really nice job of doing that, which then says- if it's Which really, I would add is complicated. I know, work. it so is. She really has, <laughs> and it is much more complicated than I ever realized, so thanks. Yeah, um, and then there's follow-up screening or follow-up assessment that happens if a student is not showing up on grade level or at the benchmark on, um, those characteristics and on the grade level, and then systems of support. So all of that work that you're doing is really helping us align with existing requirements we have in MTSS Act 173 and on evidence-based practices, which is part of our So thank you. My broad recommendation is if there are additional requests, think about broad policy and then resources and recommendations that come from the agency instead of trying to stuff everything into the bill. Uh, Massachusetts would be my example. They have a very short policy. They have some of the leading assessment results on uh, NAEP in uh, grade four and in grade eight. Um, they have been number one or in the top three uh, for about a decade. They are very strong. They have a very short policy, and then they have excellent resources on literacy instruction and on dyslexia, resources with dyslexia. So when I'm often looking for resources, I'm usually looking at So just think broad. If, if add extra stuff keeps coming this way, think about how you could have less is more in this case, and then how we can provide the specifics in the, the, uh, <laughs> the resources at the agency. Okay. On do you want me to do S three or three? No. Okay. Can, we, can I ask a couple? Yeah, questions? please. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, thank you so much, Gwen. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your help with this. Um. All along the whole journey. Uh, broad help at this point is giving me heart palpitations. Okay. So I won't go like too broad. Um, very, very yeah. specific guidance. So, if we could just look at your second bullet point. Okay. Yes. Um. I. Is there specific language that you would like us to adopt that isn't here? And if so, where would it be? Um, I, is that fair? I was working at 3.1, so I'm not at 4.1, and I do not have the either of the copies with me. There was, at one point, it said universal dyslexia screening. We there took that out. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so then I think it's been addressed. Okay, super. And then the third, I mean... I think I hear what you're what you're saying is like instead of this being like an eight page bill, maybe it should be like two or three. Page well, bill. as it, it, when you get close to the end, sometimes people bring a lot of new ideas. Oh, as that comes to, I think you're okay. on a good path mm -hmm. and, and hold the course. Is Fantastic, okay. great. So we've really taken care of all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Ms. Carmoli? Great. So three oh three. Want to give us a little sure. something? Okay. <clears throat> so there, I was. Um, I was building off the testimony that uh, Vermont Superintendents Association and Vermont Principals Association did. Um, and the Advisory Council on Literacy is very supportive of professional learning for the educators who are providing literacy and for others as well. But to require, require the full 46 hours of training for all of the educators may not be um, the uh, it may not be the best use of their time. And what I would say from a curriculum point of view, we have a lot of professional learning that we have to provide. Yeah. Literacy, mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, multi-tier systems of support, um, social emotional learning, equity, all of those are requirements. And so how to fit all of this in is part of the Jenga puzzle that we're mm -hmm. doing. 
So if there's a way to consider, um, does it, could you narrow that? So perhaps say elementary and any teacher of literacy or something to that effect would do the full lit set of literacy modules or, or professional way. And then maybe secondary grades six to 12 might do, or um, the, the teachers who are not doing literacy might only do, you know, four hours. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I think <clears throat> being part for us to make those decisions, uh, by, we, we have to look at everything. You know, we have right. to go through every single module and right. to say, hey, this is appropriate for this. But I have no issue with giving the agency Her. flexibility yes. on this um, and having them, just like we're having them decide, you know, if a three credit course at right. Champlain, Qualifies and gets them up to speed. I think that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. St. James, please. About St. James Office of Legislative Council. Um, so there was language in one of the original drafts that directed AOE to make recommendations to the standards board regarding um, specific continuing education requirements um, by endorsement. Um, and I had some concern about. The way the language was worded, I had some concern about jurisdiction regarding licensing requirements, living with the standards board and AOE. So all of that to say, there was some language in previous drafts. Mm -hmm. AOE asked me to pull that language because they have the ability to do that, Okay. to make recommendations. Mm -hmm. And I would obviously encourage you to hear from the agency, but I believe that it is their plan mm -hmm. to make recommendations related to literacy continuing education um, and tie those recommendations to endorsements. What that looks like beyond that broad um, statement, I don't know. I think so right now, if the agency, once this is passed, signed, the agency can say, hey, for K through three, we want you to do or they they can make recommendations of the standards court, and then they they would they make that decision. So these decisions lie within the standards court. <laughs> Licensing requirement. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I believe that ties in continuing education. Yep. No. It, um, okay. The jurisdiction for that is pretty clear with the standards board, um, but I believe that AOE intends to make recommendations to them. I, I'm feeling okay, but yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> I think maybe section two is still entitled mandatory completion of literacy modules. Right. You might want to change that. It just sounds very. Um, You're in 303. Yeah. 6.1. Point, point and I think you would. Oh, one second. What page is that? Was... Oh, right on the first page. I don't know. <clears throat> Well, we're still right, right. Because we're not mandating modules. We're mandating they want we want them to do something, whether it's the class of Champlain, with whatever the agency would recommend the standards board then signs off to. Please go ahead. Um, I was thinking, could it perhaps say literacy professional loan? And then that gives you some flexibility. Yeah. So I think the the uh, theme is is there a way to create some flexibility instead of saying all educators or all licensed educators that would be broader than it and not being as specific as the literacy modules. So just maybe completion of literacy professional learning or why don't we just keep broad or just, just say professional development. Or just literacy professional learning, just mm -hmm. that literacy professional learning. So it's but it is mandatory, right? Something is we're we're getting everybody up to speed, but then again, there might be people that are already up to speed. Is that what you're saying? There may be, okay. and there may be some people. So I'm imagining yeah. um, some of our unified arts, art, music, uh, yeah. uh, physical education. They are working with our students, but they are not teaching one of the core content. They're teaching their content area, which is physical education or or something to that extent. They may not need the full. Uh, so literacy professional. Boom. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Ms. Carmoli? Uh, just, uh, this is something mm -hmm. that I would say our professional organization, the Vermont Curriculum Leaders, would say when there are new requirements uh, and it requires funding, if, if, if you're 
there's a way to, as you're building a new requirement, yeah. and consider the funding that comes from that. Uh, thank you. That's my Yeah, so we are going to have in this, when we combine them, you will see um, 303 will go into 204, mm -hmm. and we will attach a position. Position isn't already in okay. there. For uh, full time. Yes. It, it's really basically solidified with the position that's held right now by Ms. Lash. Yes, the project manager. Yeah. And I think you'll see other literacy uh, things perhaps in other bills. Uh, and then other funding. Tell me specifically what you're thinking. Um, if you were to, to specify a particular, you do not. But if you were to say that everyone needs to use this particular assessment, you would, you would need, I would recommend that you provide funding for that. Right. There had to be an adjustment on the ground. Um, in the case of... This is a, if it was a full 46 hours for all educators, we would have probably need some release time, some yeah. um, substitute, some sort of um, yeah. in dollars back to the school systems in order to provide that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the types of things. That's a good point. Yeah, it's a really um, good point. There's small funding. We don't want people it. doing it on a vacation, frankly. <laughs> you know, we don't. I mean, we don't want, you know, this is, People are already under a lot of stress and have a big workload. Taking away vacation time to do 46 hours is what we're hoping to think there are. So the two teachers are expensive. Yeah. And their heart, their and their staffing their heart is, is yeah. difficult right That's now, true. finding the substitute teachers. So as you consider uh, adding something in, so an example of that is, and thank you, the Advisory Council of Literacy, if you're considering keeping that in there. Just the funding so for the small uh, daily rate uh, for the uh, council members, uh, it, it's a very minimal fee, but it's uh, a nice incentive in recognition. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. This might be a question for AOE and not you, I'm not sure. Okay. The modules, mm -hmm. the actual modules, do, does the state of Vermont own those now? Or is to be open? So they okay. own them, I believe, for a stretch of time. I, that uh, it's either four or five years, but I believe what they don't own is the platform. So the funding in order to deliver the modules, I believe, ends with the ESSER funding. Mm -hmm. But that is something you would say. that last bit again. The, it, it, so the modules, been, they yeah. are owned for a stretch of time. Yeah. They, sort of being they, rented. Correct. Yeah. And there is a platform that they go with, but the, yeah. I believe that the funding for the platform goes away. So there needs to be funding. It's what? called Pepper, I believe. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know the amount. I, I don't know the cycle of um, uh, uh, renewal, but I believe that okay. the platform needs to we be We can talk to Ms. Lash about it. I would like to do that. I'm, I'm just concerned tying any kind of requirements to these modules if they're not, you know, if they may not be here in perpetuity for us. Right. You know. I, I think you've discussed some other ways, some other possibilities. Right. Yeah. The professional sure. learning, there are other organizations yeah. providing that. There are other state agencies that have uh, professional learning. There are a number of resources on our state agency. Uh, so there are other ways. There are courses you could take. Um, both in person or online. Um, some have, may have already come with their expertise. They may have a reading specialist endorsement. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are other ways to receive. But it still is, I'm glad you raised it. It's still a question. I, I don't know how this works in other states with other trainings, if this is standard. I mean, we made a big investment. Yes. And I guess I thought we own them in a different way. So, okay. Please. Uh, process question. Yeah. So at what point do we anticipate combining 303 with 204? I'm hoping today we might be able to do it if the committee's comfortable with saying, um, given the amendments, given everything we've talked about, could we have a motion that would, would put 302, 303 into 204? But I'm not sure if everybody would. I mean, that's sort of been our, that has been our plan all along. Um, and I'm just looking to see if there's any real concern about it. Can we wait till tomorrow? I just want to sure. one absolute read of all of these drafts. And remember, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a vote on right. the final bill right. until Friday. Right. Yeah. But yes, 
Yeah. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had a question was raised about what to do with uh, home schools. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that was ever really addressed or if we're just like not. To the question. Yeah. So we do have them coming in, you know, next or 3.30, oh. but not necessarily on this topic, but we can pull them in a little bit and have a conversation around this because we wanted to make sure that everybody, you know, want, I think it's a penalty. Kids, you can hope school. I don't know the number. Not getting, please. I did research this a little bit. So homeschoolers do not have the same requirements. They do have a requirement to uh, register their plan or develop their plan, but they do not have requirements to do the same uh, funding, professional learning, or to follow uh, what's outlined by the approved public schools or uh, the, the public schools are approved independent schools. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I don't know how to create that yeah. within this, we can, and that's we can, up to yeah. you, but it's something I think that we will work on. It, that it's not, yeah. they're not part of the committee. And it might be something we have the House do, um, depending on timing, but if this committee wants to put in, that's fine too. It's a curiosity question. How yep. old is 3Q concept? That was it in, like... I have no idea. I could look it up. I could... Do you know Ms. Carmel? Well, yeah. I, I don't know the specific year, but in uh, early 90s, I believe, um, the there are two major publishers that have been using that. Um, it sort of came out of, uh, there was some very specific, very tight instruction that was kind of skill-based. It wasn't getting enough on the broad reading and understanding. And so the intention, I believe, is on reading for understanding. But what it missed was how to build some of those skills, those foundational skills that are, are critical. Uh, but I believe that it, it's um, the process or the those two publishing companies uh, were doing it in the early 90s and forward. Thank you. So, Molly, are you good for now? I am. I, I, do you have any? No, if you wouldn't mind sticking around, um, that would be terrific. I'm going to uh, shift because we have had folks here for a while. Um, but before we do so, Ms. St. James, you were, you were here to, talk, to walk us through 303 and um, 284. I also don't want to hold you up. There have been changes to uh, 204 based on the conversation we just had. Um, and there have been a, at least one change, the title to 303. Uh, do you mind coming back tomorrow with the new clear drafts of with changes and edits? Yes, I think you have them all. I think you have everything. Um, but if you'd like me to come back tomorrow, I'm happy to do that. So let me just make sure. One note on page four. So there have been no changes made to S204. Uh, and just based on this conversation. Oh, no. Thank you. And then 303, the only change is the title on section two. Correct, but there have been other changes. Right, I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and anything else, though, that the committee wants to discuss or raise on these two bills at this point? Otherwise, I think we're going to wait and hear a walkthrough tomorrow because we do have witnesses who are here in person that I'd like to uh, hear from. That's fine. Um, you also had me on two other bills. Did you still need me on those? Yeah, so we have you on, well, we have you on 284 and 191. I think we'll do all the walkthroughs tomorrow. Okay. We'll so do some shifts and adjustments. I think you're done for, okay. for now. And uh, we'll shift to homeschooling and ask, uh, is it Ms. Ratchie? Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. You want to join us? Hi. Good to see you again. Please come on up. Hope that feels okay. I think we're we're mm -hmm. getting a good spot. And you can look them both over. Yeah. And then, and then we can just make that motion and get some more testimony. How are you? Great. How yeah. are you? It's good to see you. We met 
Oh, were down. Were you in Bennington at one point? Yes, it was. Um, we'll see you all. That's Their right. Anniversary. That's right. Yeah, it's nice to see you again. Good yeah, to see yeah, you. Yeah, we'll go around and introduce ourselves just so you know everyone around the table. Uh, Senator Shi. We've met. Not good to see you again. It's good to see you. I'm Martine. I think we've met in College of Welfare. Yes. Yeah. Brian Bennington County. Senator Weeks. Dave Weeks, Rowan County. So we have you, thank you for coming in, around homeschooling and educational neglect is the title. Mm -hmm. I also what? have um, Nancy Miller here as well. Nancy, you great. Do you want to come up me? together? Is that sure. Okay, terrific. As long as you're both comfortable with that, we certainly are. And we are talking, uh, I believe we're Senator Sheen, um, and then I think there's some concern out there broadly around whether or not we need to make some changes to our homeschooling policy that was altered last year. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you coming in and we'd love to know what you're seeing on the ground, concerns, and for yours. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah. It's good to see all of you for the record. My name is Erica Radke, and I'm Deputy Commissioner of the Family Services Division of DCF. And I have with me Nancy Miller, who is our child safety manager as well. Um, really, what we want to talk to you about today is uh, the elimination of the supervisory rules around homeschooling and the question of whether educational neglect uh, that may occur uh, because of that absence. And I do want to start by noting that FSD screening criteria and report acceptance guidance, they have not changed following the Agency of Education's updated statute. Uh, if there is a report alleging educational neglect and we learn that the child is enrolled in a approved home study program with AOE, uh, we don't accept the report and we don't do any further assessment of the quality of the home education, homeschool education. Uh, our school, our staff, they're not educators. Uh, we don't have experience in evaluating curricula, uh, but however, if there is a report, report alleging educational neglect and we do accept it, and then we discover that the child is enrolled in a home study program through AOE, and we verify this information with AOE, uh, barring any uh, other child abuse or neglect issues, then we close out our CHINS the Educational Neglect Assessment. FSD's understanding of Act 66 of 2023 is that the parent must provide a signed statement that the child's progress in the home study program is being assessed and that the parent must maintain records of the assessments. Uh, this can include a standardized assessment administered by the school, a licensed teacher reviewing the student's progress, a portfolio of work, including a summary of learning provided by the parent or grades from an online school or GED. So FSC, you wouldn't revisit a report about educational neglect unless the school district or AOE made a subsequent report indicating the attestation of academic progress suggested some kind of educational neglect, which would need to include some evidence of negligence. Um, and so that's really the standard that we're working under in terms of we don't necessarily pursue these kinds of issues unless there's an additional evidence of negligence or educational neglect. Um, I will turn it over to Nancy now, who will talk really more specifics about how we assess educational neglect at FSD. Great. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for having us. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit initially about statutory authority. Um, so Title 33, Chapters 49 and Chapter 51 uh, grant the department um, Department for Children and Families, the authority to conduct assessments regarding the welfare of a child. So the focus of Chapter 49 is really child abuse and neglect, with definitions of child abuse and neglect um, defined in 33 BSA 4912. So examples include physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional maltreatment, neglect, and risk of harm. The department may also conduct an assessment under the authority of 33 BSA 5106. And the focus of this assessment is on whether a child may be in need of care and supervision. So examples of that include lack of parental capacity, substance-exposed newborns, 
caretaker's behavior suggesting a child may be without proper parental care and educational neglect. So educational neglect falls under the um, 5106 as opposed to the 4912. Educational neglect is not um, by definition in the state of Vermont a form of abuse and neglect in chapter 49, but we do have the statutory authority under 5106 to address it. So it's important to mention though that um, educational neglect is always assessed in partnership with the school. Our assessments really focus on um, addressing the barriers to the child attending school and supporting the family in addressing those barriers not the education itself that the child is receiving or not receiving. So screening um, reports and acceptance of criteria, um, a report of educational neglect is considered for acceptance when it is alleged that a parent or a person responsible for a child's care knowingly fails to enroll a child in school or to provide education in accordance with 16 VSA 1121. Through the parents or caretakers action or inaction, the child is regularly failing to attend school. Educational neglect is considered for children beginning at the age six until the completion of sixth grade, where the expectation is that the parent or the caretaker is responsible for getting the child to school and the parent or caretaker's behaviors have contributed to the child's lack of attendance. Um, the parent is responsible for the child's attendance at a public school an approved or recognized independent school or a home study program for the full number of days which that school is held unless the child is mentally or physically unable to attend or has completed the 10th grade or is excused by the superintendent or a majority of the school directors or is enrolled in and attending post-secondary school which is approved and accredited in Vermont or another state. Educational neglect is reserved for children age six through sixth grade, or through the end of sixth grade, beginning at grade seven, lack of school attendance for 20 or more days, not due to illness or super suspension, is considered truancy, and Family Services Division defers to the school to refer that matter to the local state's attorney to file a truancy petition with the court. Truancy applies to youth from grade seven up until uh, age 18, I'm uh, sorry, age 16, uh, who are registered for school and not attending. So when we receive a report uh, about educational neglect at a child protection hotline, um, we ask the following questions. Is the child or youth registered for school? What is the total number of absences? How does the school measure absences? And what is the parent or guardian's explanation for the absences? How many of the absences were due to medical or psychiatric condition? And has the school verified this with the provider? And uh, what steps have been taken by the school thus far to address school attendance? What communication or attempts at communication with the parents have occurred? And then how have the parents responded to those attempts? We also want to know if the child receives any special accommodations or services that are only delivered through the school, such as patient therapy, physical therapy, et cetera. Um, just some data um, going back to 2018, and this data is in the written testimony, which was submitted a couple of weeks ago. Um, the numbers, uh, let's see. So you'll see there's a little bit of a dip in 2019. So in 2018, we accepted 114 assessments. In 2019, we accepted 96, and these are all educational neglect assessments. In 2020, we had 139. In 2021, we had 167. Uh, 126. We um, in 2022 we had 126, and then last year we had 150. So um, we do have um, we have seen some inconsistency and variations across school districts um, when. Um, receiving reports of educational neglect. So um, one of those pockets of variation is around how absences are counted and defined. So what is excused versus unexcused, um, what that means varies depending on the school. So some schools no longer differentiate between excused and unexcused absences, and this varies by district. Some schools will send letters after five days or 10 days, 
um, or I'm sorry, 15 or 20 applicants. Some schools will make calls to the parent um, in, in conjunction with the letters. Um, some schools will make calls to the parent without writing any letters. Um, and some schools employ a home visit as part of their efforts. And the home visit can be conducted by uh, a school principal, a guidance counselor, or a school resource officer. We are noting that there seems to be many schools um, that no longer have uh, the school resource officer position. Um, some schools unenroll students after 10 consecutive absences when the reasons for the absence is deemed insufficient. So these differences, so these differences result in disparity for students across the state, sometimes even within the same county. Some schools make a report to the division before 20 days of unexcused absences, and then others wait far longer for various reasons, including not wanting to damage their relationship with family. So we are hearing um, in Chittenden County, anecdotally, that the majority of um, the educational neglect reports we are receiving are coming from school districts uh, with more people of color, higher rates of poverty, and more housing insecurity or rental housing versus communities with more home house, owned housing. So post-COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen an increase in reports of educational neglect related to children's mental health issues and school refusal. And this results in reports being accepted for educational neglect assessment with their focus on supporting the family to access mental health services, which are generally more difficult to access compared to pre-2020. Um, okay, thank you. So I'm just thinking of the question that I know you all are grappling with is should the Family Services Division respond to concerns about inadequate home study programs? And I'm thinking about the role of FSD in the area of education. It's important to pause and think about the ultimate goal uh, and ensuring that the state of Vermont is using the right tool for the job. We all want children to receive a quality education within the context of their families, and we want families to have strong connections to their communities and to avoid and to avail themselves of services that, that are there to help them to meet their basic needs. As the child, as a child safety intervention conducted by the Child Protection Agency may not be the best tool to support a family towards those educational goals. You know, we all know there's a perception in the community about what it means to have a family services worker or not brought into work. As much as we try to engage families and support prevention efforts towards uh, a child well-being, the reality is, is that we are the Child Protection Agency. Our involvement is non-voluntary, and it often comes with some apprehension on the part of families. Non-voluntary government intervention is a tool we really believe should be reserved for matters related to child safety and public safety. Reports of educational neglect detract from the child protection function. Uh, given the division, like many other agencies, is operating with a diminished capacity, we're really focusing our efforts on child safety and fulfilling our mandate to respond to child abuse and neglect. It undermines our ability to keep children safe when our scope of work exceeds our core mission. Uh, it's not, and it really shouldn't be, FSD's place to qualitatively evaluate a home study program and to ensure that children meeting age-appropriate educational benchmarks from pre-K to grade 12. Our family services workers don't have the training or background in education to conduct this type of educational assessment. Curriculum development and evaluation is really an extremely uh, specialized skill set, and it is outside of FSD's professional scope. In conclusion, we would wholeheartedly support AOE in having an oversight or enforcement arm to be able to assess the quality of homeschool programs, as well as to address educational neglect. We would also be in support of AOE revisiting their statute to address any unintended consequences that may have come from the home study rule change. And we also really would welcome uh, increased partnerships between DCF, AOE, and DMH, and the mental health designated agencies regarding school absenteeism from children's mental health. Thank you for this. Thank you both. And I want to apologize for 
making you both wait so long. I, you know, I know you're both busy and it's just that time of year, but I, I do apologize for that. No um, Many questions or comments? Yes, please center weeks. So. Uh, yeah, a couple questions. So, um, uh, first, two about homeschooling specific, then two about your APA agency. Yeah, that's right. Two plus two. All right. So, in a in the in the um, concept of educational neglect, how uh, how would that be initiated, or has it ever been initiated via uh, um, uh, GFC and, and your your DCL or uh, Family Services Division. You mean in terms of homeschooling? Yeah, yeah. Have there ever been any? I can think of a recent one where it had come up, but since there was an approved home study program, we we were yeah. not able to open the case. But Nancy, can you think of some where we have, you know, initiated and opened the case? Not when the. What we do is we confirm with Agency of Education that the family is enrolled in an accredited homeschooling program. And once we learn that, then we don't go forward um, with any kind of an assessment. So, so is it safe to assume that none of the, the complaints that are all on here were were related to homeschool? That's correct. Okay, that's right. Those all have to do with absentee from from schools. And then specific to Family Services Division, if you were a minor, how complicated is it? To raise your hand and say uh, there's an abusive scenario in my family. How complicated is that? You know, I think that a lot of times we've been we talk to kids about a trusted adult. So if they are in the school, they can reach out to a counselor, they can reach out to uh, a teacher, and also there is the hotline. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily difficult. I think it's more of the child maybe internally being afraid of the consequences. So not necessarily the mechanism to get to us. I think it's those outside uh, concerns and worries that might keep a, a child from making the call, which they should make. Mm -hmm. But Nancy, what would you? I would just add there's, um, there are other um, venues or vehicles, if you will, for a child to, to make that outcry, such as to a pediatrician, to a relative, to a neighbor. Um, we often sometimes will get reports from uh, the parent of a best friend um, that's a vehicle for a child to sometimes ask for help. Certainly schools are one of our larger bodies of mandated reporters, but um, those other community members and, and in the medical field um, are right there as well. Right. And law enforcement also. Okay, good. And then do you have any statistics on like how many complaints there are in a year? Yeah. How many accusations of abuse there are, you know, in a year? Generally yeah, speaking, just, just off the top sense. of my head, I think it's about 24,000 was last 24, year. I would have to, um, I can call it up easily. And we accepted over 4,000 interventions. 24,000 calls from the get to the hub. Coming into the hub. Let me double check that. I do not have a head for not no, to fly no, when it's, it's social fine. work. <laughs> but 4,000 interventions <laughs> per year. We're going to double check it. Really. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's all. Thank you. Oh, Senator Senator Sheen, please. Yeah. Thank you for uh, the testimony. I think, um, I mean, I, I would agree that, you know, FSD shouldn't be the, um, you know, the, the part of DCF that's evaluating home study programs. But I think my main concern or question is more so about the interagency collaboration when something like this comes in, uh, because I, I know that there can be situations where educational neglect, educational neglect is happening. Maybe not as defined here, but you know, a kid who's enrolled in a homeschool program but is just not getting homeschooling. But then there's also a parallel complaint of they're also not they, they don't have access to food, they're or they're being physically abused. Mm -hmm. And so when that you know, a just let's say a distraught family member calls. DCF first, and you know they just lay all this out on the table. Uh, aside from just confirming, aside from confirming with AOE that they are indeed in the homeschool program, is there any more like information sharing 
or I, I guess teamwork uh, to figure out how or if this kid could be helped? Wait, you're sorry. 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 I think I heard, I think I heard most of the question. And by the way, it's 19,000. 725 reports in 2022, and I don't have the 2023 data yet. Yeah, intervention number? Uh, inter phone intervention number, um, 4,526 child safety interventions. Okay. You're welcome. So when you're assessing um, whether or not to accept a report of neglect, and you're talking about lack of food in the home, or I forget some of the other things that you said. Physical abuse things, yeah. Okay, so, well, so there's different acceptance criteria for neglect versus physical abuse. Um, so with neglect, we would want to know, um, we would want to hear a little bit about, like, see evidence, because we don't need evidence at the point of report acceptance, but how does the reporter know that the children are not receiving adequate nutrition? Have we received any reports from the pediatrician? Has there been a loss of, a loss of weight? Um, is there are there, is there a you know health condition stemming from the lack of appropriate nutrition, or has the reporter been in the home and not seen you know has has seen like no food for extended lengths of time? We would want to hear some you know information in that regard regarding lack of um, lack of nutrition uh, with physical injury. Um, we would be looking for um, observation of of uh, injury itself or a disclosure from a child that they have received an injury. Um, an injury or a bruise is not necessarily needed for acceptance, however, like if the child is reporting that they're being, um, I'm just going to speak bluntly because this is child abuse we're talking about. So if a child is reporting that they're being hit with a, a belt or something like that on their bare skin, um, especially a younger child under the age of six, that's the kind of, you know, we would be looking for specific information. It's really hard sometimes we do receive information that may be too um, ambiguous to accept. It doesn't, just doesn't rise to the level such as I'm worried that they're not getting nutritional food from a family member. That wouldn't necessarily be enough to open a child safety intervention. We'd be looking for that specific detail. But I would add, though, the uh, family services workers that work the hotline are very skilled and they do ask questions. There's a give and take. But after a certain point, if there's nothing additional specific, then you know we wouldn't be able to accept the, the report. But depending upon what evidence or what information was provided, you know, then we may move to the next steps. Yes. Yes. That's helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, getting back to education and our, you know, the purview of homeschooling and so on. Did I hear you say, or am I hearing you say that it it might be beneficial or helpful to remove the educational neglect from 33 VSA 5106, or am I making that up? Or is it somewhere in between? We haven't, no, we didn't say that in us explicitly. No. Yeah, but it seems as though, I don't know, there's some discomfort or I, tension. Yeah. I think when, um, you know, thinking back during um, COVID, during lockdown time, when you know, that that's a time when I can really recall our workforce really struggling um, to maintain the reports of educational neglect and sort of like, how do we approach this when, you know, the whole, seems like the whole world is really struggling to try to figure out how to educate kids um, during lockdown. Um, you know, when we are, when our folks are, um, when our district offices are understaffed and they have um, an educational neglect assessment, what they're really looking to do is, like I said before, just like really partner with the school to address those barriers. Um, it, they're very different than uh, child abuse and neglect investigations. Yeah, that's, I guess that's why I'm asking the question is I just wonder if it's something that would be better housed with AOE, for example, and folks working in education. And it's just a thought that I'm having as we're going through this. Maybe we can. I mean, I think it is a it. better fit for sure. Right. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Hey, your concluding thoughts are really helpful. Um, again, full heartedly supporting AOE, having oversight and enforcement arms, people assess. Um, supporting AOE, revisiting their statute to address any unintended consequences. Certainly what we're, we're concerned that last year, um, in the move, in the in taking steps to streamline and make things easier, there may have been some unintended consequences and we wanna to try to, if we can, fix those in our miscellaneous education bill this year. Uh, and then uh, the welcome to partnership between all of you, AOA, AOE and DMH, that Senator uh, James quite a comment about how much interagency is breaking down some of these silos, these kinds of situations. And I do think that that's important because, I mean, we're all here trying to help kids and if the connection between particularly mental health and absenteeism, that's something sure. that we can get involved in upstream so that the children don't end up it having some kind of binding or identity, you know, DCF has to get involved so much the better to keep the families supported and intact. If I could just seek one one more point to your question about um, removing from 51 to um, 53. I think it's really important for folks to understand that what gives the division the, um, the authority and any teeth, if you will, in that chapter are chintz proceedings and um to write an affidavit bring something to the attention of the court as a response to um a child not attending school um can sometimes feel like a really heavy-handed instrument for that problem and that's why we continue to sort of ask is this really the right tool for the job is child protection, the child protection agency, the best agency to address um, absenteeism and like chronic absenteeism? Yeah, yeah I just was going to follow up. I really appreciate you bringing up, you know, in your concluding thoughts, like that what is the role of AOE in oversight and enforcement? Because I think this is a question that we ask ourselves a lot. Um, so I, I appreciate you bringing it up. I think it's a really important question too. Yeah. Thanks. Frankly, I don't think in my years in this building, we've given really enough attention to the homeschooling, you know, issue, not issue, but in general, talk about homeschooling, what it looks like, what we're doing, what the expectations are. And it, it, it comes up here and there, but it, we really haven't jumped in as much as I, I would like to. Anything else? Thanks a million. We may have you back in as we kind of find some language, probably during town meeting, we working with folks to you know, better understand what steps we might take to rectify the problem that may have been created last year. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. We've met also. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not very memorable. Uh, <laughs> I, I hear that all the time. Uh, thanks, everybody. So tomorrow, let me see this revised. We've revised Thanksgiving schedule. We'll, doesn't look like we're going to be on the floor very long. Hopefully not. Beth will come in at one thirty to talk through 191. Then we're going to do the walkthrough in new draft of 220 libraries, which I think we're almost there. Uh, Attorney General is coming in to talk 120, uh, S120. Um, if you'd like to come in and talk about Senator Sheen's bill, S167, miscellaneous amendments to S, and, and all these are pretty quick. That will do the walkthrough and work up on S204 and S303. Hopefully, we'll be able to combine those puppies. 284, and then uh, literacy uh, in independent schools at 430. Which of those, if any, are you proposing or going to vote? So I think possibly, if if we're, if we're good with it, I think new advancement grants. I, I think technology, we just need to walk through again. And 
have a conversation. I think we will have a vote about combining 204 and 303, which I don't see as controversial. Um, and I think that's it. And then the next day, I'd love to be able to vote that new version of 204, which will have 303 in it uh, on Friday. And um, possibly we will also part with, if we haven't parted with 191, we'll part with that as well as libraries and technology. So, and then when we come back, miscellaneous ed, uh, CTE, and S120. So.